pleased to uh, welcome Alex Ann Mayan back to the School of Architecture and Community Design here at USF. Uh, <clears throat> he was kind enough to lecture some years ago, and uh, um, we're very pleased that he's back. He also um, gave a really nice presentation to a group of students who visited his office in Boston in the fall of 2019, and some of you were we're in that studio, so it'll be good for you to take a look at the work again and see what he's been up to. Um, a couple of announcements before we get going. As always, we'll go ahead and have you mute um, your, your microphones during the course of the talk and shut off your cameras. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, for your information, upcoming uh, lecture on April 1, is none other than Brian Cantley, our good friend, who I think is online today watching the talk. He'll be coming live from LA. And uh, on April 22nd, Everell Colas, from the founding partner of Store and Studio for Architecture based in St. Pete in Miami, will be here. Another good friend and really glad Everell could join us then. Um, Alex is a dear friend. I've known him for 40 years that I just pointed out to him this fact and he gasped as do I when I think about it. It's hard to believe. Uh, we were colleagues in undergraduate and graduate school um, and with great pleasure I've watched his firm flourish over the last 25 years in Boston. His partner Nick Winton um, was also uh, I think a colleague of his at school and um, uh, their firm has grown from, as you might expect, a project or two that seeded the firm to a wide range of, of, of projects with um, private and public uh, entities, with um, institutional entities, quite, quite significant and prestigious in institutional groups. And um, the thing about the work that's interesting is that you can see the roots of the work in Alex's projects as a undergrad and graduate student who's always interested in tectonics. He was always interested in how you put things together. And there's uh, always a formal and spatial clarity to the work. And I think that um, habits good and bad that you learn in school can carry forth with you. So try to maximize the good habits, right? Um, uh, I won't go into a <clears throat> lengthy introduction only to say the firm has been published widely, has um, received any number of awards for the work, including national AIA awards. Um, it has um, been recognized uh, in, in, in numerous publications abroad and domestic. And uh, what's really nice is that it has managed to stay a, pr a fairly small studio, a fairly small office, and it has a real hands-on sensibility they build very careful articulate models of the work to explain to clients and for maybe purposes of exhibition and certainly to study the things themselves. And I think the students were quite um, stunned by the quality of the models that the office built to test their own work. So, um, and, and I also mentioned Alex has uh, still teaches, taught in any number of places, including MIT, uh, where he's a frequent lecturer. And it's just great to have him here. So Alex, I will hand this over to you. You can take it away. Okay, thank you, Bob. <clears throat> and let me first apologize to the uh, students that were up here because th they might be looking at the same work. Uh, given this past year, uh, we have not done a lot of uh, documentation of new work. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on, um, I think, themes that are uh, uh, relevant to all of our work and have always been relevant. Um, let me let me make sure I can get this <laughs> up first. Uh, can you tell me, Bob? Do can you see a single screen there? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so I um, th thank you for joining today. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys again. Unfortunately, I can't see your faces, um, but. Uh, I thought I would just focus on, uh, in a sense, the subtext here, deliberations on making, which for us always involve the most, what we find to be the kind of rudimentary things, <clears throat> tools that we have in, in uh, making architecture uh, and things like architecture. 
Um, for us, it's a, it's all about choices and editing, as you probably know in Design Studio, you 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 go through that all the time, um, and that just continues uh, as part of the discipline uh, as you move forward. Of course, professionalism comes into that and introduces a whole range of uh, complexity to that. But in the end, you know, we find that uh, focusing on the discipline is the more difficult and rudimentary part of making good architecture. Um, so I'm going to just look at a, a bunch of projects, start with an installation project and end with an installation project that are uh, almost similar in scale. Uh, but and then we'll look at some larger projects in between uh, of different types. But the point of it is um, that the way we think about uh, uh, a, an installation or something small can be the same uh, as uh, when we're thinking about larger buildings. Um, in terms of these notions, and we often start with a, a material notion or a spatial notion or a formal notion as we move through a project uh, to initiate it. So <laughs> this is I only I only show this because I think it's really important to understand what defines our relationship to buildings and why some buildings and some building styles even this is not a discussion about anything stylistic but why some kinds of architecture are um adored by the public let's say and maybe some other types are not and i think it has a lot to do with um composition and um configuration meaning the what what are the parts that make up the whole uh, what are their proportions uh, and how does the material uh, inform texture or vice versa? How does light inform that? How does how does it change um, on a diurnal basis? How does it change on an annual basis? And how does it change when you move through space and, and you engage the architecture? And I think all those things, when you look at you know, a typical traditionalist house of any, you know, particular brand. Um, those are the kinds of things I think that matter to people on on many levels and that it it is associated then, unfortunately, with style. Um, but I believe that it can be done in, in the abstract and actually convey the same kind of intimacy that people enjoy uh, with a good piece of architecture. So having said that, I just want to look at this kind of in the abstract. Um, it, you know, here we're looking at some materials, right? There's a, a twine, a, a, a piece of cloth and a brick. Um, and the fourth material here, the immaterial part of that is the way light, light is interacting with them and falling on them. Um, and often uh, as we think about these things, there's the, a kind of quotidian approach to it where um, you might put these things together like this, for example, right? Where you you protect the brick and you wrap it with the twine and light becomes kind of underutilized here because it, it isn't an integral part of this assembly of things. Uh, one could uh, espouse the virtues of this, but in the end, uh, I, I really enjoy looking at this painting by uh, Carlos Madrid called Silence where those same materials are assembled in a way where they inform one another in in where these let's say these ordinary materials and their assembly inform light shadow etc in ways that are extraordinary um, and so this is a kind of encapsulation of the way we enjoy approaching architecture um, often using uh, rather ordinary materials and this is an example very early example, I think this was our, our second or third project uh, where uh, we were asked to create editorial spaces for the American Meteorological Society inside of a 200 year old barn that is part of a, a bullfinch estate uh, uh, near the state house in Boston. And, and again, here it, it's it's all low budget stuff It's not about you know, expensive materials necessarily, but it's a way of thinking, well, this is one large space. How can we amplify that space with the intervention of forms? Uh, how are those forms built of what materials? You know, in this case, it the, the object that amplifies the singularity of the space 
is actually the emanator of light because we couldn't put uh, any penetrations into this building, any new ones, uh, because of its historic nature. So with that, I'm just going to jump to a, um, a project that we did recently in Amman, Jordan, uh, that was part of a, a competition for the Amman Design Week. Uh, and we called it left of passage, right of passage. It's a, it's a bit of a, a play on words in that um, left and right at, at in, in, in sort of older times in this part of the world <clears throat> were synonymous or the same word actually for north and south. Um, when, you're, when your orientation was really east, not necessarily just for religious reasons, but for where the sun rose. Uh, and so this is Wadi Rum in, in, in southern Jordan uh, that, that is a kind of um, important place, a, a kind of scaleless landscape. Oh, as parenthetically, this is where uh, it actually looks like this. It's where Mars was filmed, the movie Mars. So that redness is part of it. Um, but it's a place where civilizations have passed through this as a kind of threshold uh, uh, in, in this valley of Jordan. And it's just steeped in history. And so we, uh, we were intent on making a piece that thought about the kind of consideration of this idea of movement um, and threshold at a kind of and, and a play on scale. Because it's hard to understand your scale in these kinds of um, uh, uh, landscapes. And, and so in, in some ways we were even thinking about the kind of, and also it's a changeable landscape because the winds move sand, etc. And in that regard, we were thinking about the kind of imagination of a child, you know, like caught up in laundry and the way it moves and is quite changeable and the way light falls on it, etc and thought about doing something out of fabric that would envelop one to create a kind of threshold. So this is, these are, again, the deliberations are, uh, they jump all over the place, but in thinking about the fabric and, and the kind of imagination, et cetera, we started immediately thinking about, well, we don't know anything about fabric. Let's examine that. And we went through a whole kind of uh, uh, study and research on how it's made, et cetera, et cetera. And we came up with a very simple idea in the exhibition hall of creating a couple of sheets that drop down and create a threshold. But one of the things that in, in looking at this that was troublesome originally in thinking about it was that the direction uh, was not significant. If you move through it one way or the other in this kind of preliminary form would have no effect. Uh, and so we were thinking about it. Well, that's a problem because when you move uh, uh, east to west, west to east, it's a, it's a very different experience, obviously. On top of that, we jumped to a kind of material idea. We were wanting to make something that was quite large. That, that rendering that I just showed you is about 25 feet tall. Um, and we started to communicate with uh, various partners there about what material was available within a very constrained budget, of course. Um, uh, the, so we, here you're looking at the materials that we ended up using, which is essentially hemp, uh, about a half inch diameter uh, rebar, similar diameter, and then just some uh, two by four lumber. Um, we ultimately made this project out of uh, three kilometers of rope and a, and a kilometer and a half of rebar. But in thinking about these materials, it, it's just the way they're sort of uh, presented here. If you reconsider those materials and think about them in a different way, you start to find similarities between them, potentially. Um, and maybe even in, in texture and color and organization and its linearity, et cetera, and even its sectional qualities. And so we, you know, are again jumping in terms of our deliberations and, and zooming in out of various scales. And you know, one of the things we did was we we got a a, a coil of hemp and started looking at it, and th it has a kind of form to it and an organization to it. And we zoomed into it a little bit and said, well, that's interesting. It's each strand is made up of a series of strands that are twisted together. And we looked at this and realized that. Well, if we, you know, when we turned that sort of 45 degrees, there was a kind of linearity in the other direction that was latent. It wasn't sort of obvious in that coil. And so we immediately said about, we got some rebar, we got some rope, we just started, you know, prototyping and, and we did this. 
which was pretty cool. We thought, well, that's interesting. It's like fabric, but it's made of metal and, and rope. But we ran into technical problems immediately. For example, if you look at each pair of rebar, there's nothing stopping them from moving. And so that was a disappointment. We thought maybe we're failing here. So we went to the computer and started to examine different weaves. Uh, and in doing that, which was satisfying from a kind of uh, a formal perspective to understand and do, do this very, rather quickly, the tactility of it and the ability to test it to see if it really worked was insufficient. So we went back to our um, our prototype and tried now instead of weaving around every two and skipping two on the way back, we would skip one on the way back, which put us with gave us an offset. And you'll, you'll find this sort of thing very common in much of the work we do. What this did was it was a purely technical exercise. It stopped the rebar from moving entirely. But look what we got. We got a texture and a pattern that we didn't necessarily expect. And what was really interesting was examining that within our studio, we realized that if you look at it from in, a, in an oblique angle from one side or look at it from the other side, it's a completely different thing. One is purely textural, the other is almost pattern-like. And so that fed back into our dissatisfaction with the symmetry of what we had and said, well, maybe the nuance is that the way the rope is applied to make the, the, the fabric of these two dissimilar materials might create a kind of difference in direction. And so we went back to that original idea of hanging two sheets, as you can see on the left side, and then pulling them apart, uh, the next one over. And then we applied it, because it was in, in a predominantly Islamic country, we applied one square to the other uh, as a kind of cultural relevance, and then pulled the, the point out to create that pyramidal form um, and in doing so realized sectionally, uh, let me see, can you see my pointer on here, Bob? Yeah, I can see it, Alex. Right. Okay, so uh, what we realized here was that we, we could create a kind of, uh, a, within this overall threshold, a kind of threshold into the space a larger space in the center, and then a threshold exiting the space. And this is what's represented in this drawing here and this drawing. So when you stand in the middle of it, you're in the largest space. So that there's a kind of enveloping, again, that notion of being sort of inside something. And then we tested that on the on uh, digitally to, to see if, in fact, we could get a different texture in one direction than the other, and it worked. So we moved forward from that and then looked at various kinds of, you know, nuances in the weaving, how that might, uh, uh, how light might affect your perception of it as you move through it, etc., and how shadows might uh, affect uh, the appearance and create new forms. So we set that aside and then we started to actually work on this. And one of the things that was quite interesting technically is that if we created a, 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 a condition here where every single one was different in terms of the bends, which you can see the series down here, they are in fact, the angle of each one is exactly the same because of the pyramidal form, which allowed a kind of automation at on the site to create these. So we partnered with some folks there and metal workers who were very kind to make these pieces for us. There are uh, 200 of them altogether. Again, they're 25, they're more than 25 feet in length, but the overall height is 25 feet. And then there was the interesting uh, 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 need to create, to, to invent a scaffolding because you know, we did, there, we had no machine, you know, we go back to that image of the, of the weaving machine. Um, you know, obviously that sort of thing wouldn't work here. So we had to create our own sort of loom, so to speak, something to hold the rebar in place while we pass the, the, um, the rope through it. And this is just a, a, a kind of quick time lapse that I really enjoy because it's, it's a bunch of Jordanians, uh, some uh, steel workers, some carpenters, and then two of our people from the office and two weavers, one Palestinian, one Jordanian, who are actual weavers, which to me was uh, quite interesting. And the four of them uh, over a period of five days literally did the weaving like this to create the, the piece. 
Um, and so the final effects of that, again, are, are plays on scale and light and texture and shadow. Ultimately, like that first image of the uh, house that I showed you, um, here we're trying to do something more where those kinds of things that 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 bind you to architecture very personally happen but we 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 enjoy uh the kind of uh, potential of a different perception of scale so i'm just going to run through these images again if we just focus on those issues of texture and light and material here we start here you start to liken in these kinds of images liken two very dissimilar materials into a singular form and to, into a singular space below if you look across if you look across here it even affects the way you perceive people walking on the mezzanine because it digitizes them as they move through it uh, and then the the pattern that's formed uh, along uh, the, the piece in one direction and how it changes in the other and how light affects it in significant ways in the way you perceive the inside or the outside forms uh, and then the the moments of threshold and their effect on uh, things around them and then there's the kind of human occupation of it which i i found very interesting the way people interacted with the the piece and we have all kinds of photos which i won't go through here of people doing things inside uh, including getting themselves in it symmetrically with their arms open or various things and taking photographs of themselves. And then again, the perception of the thing as a, as a monumental object. But what you're seeing here, which is so strange, is because of the lighting conditions here, that person is walking on the other side of the building on the, on the, uh, on the mezzanine, but appears to be inside of it. So it's those sorts of things that we sort of enjoy in architecture um, as ways of the piece transforming, depending again on lighting conditions and your position in space relative uh, to the piece. So in line with that, this is a, com a very different project. It's the uh, um, it's it's the watershed project for the Institute of Contemporary Art, which is um, there, there's a, a the Institute of Contemporary Art that was designed by Diller and Scafidio is here in. Uh, in the in the uh, uh, in South Boston, uh, in an area that's undergoing now monumental development at a, at a pace which is unbelievable, and then there's uh, and this is called the Seaport District, and then right across from it is East Boston, which has been for a very very long time uh, the landing point for immigrants. So the, the, the culture here has changed over time, depending on the, um, the, the, the particular ethnicity of the, and culture of the immigrants there. So this was an outreach to create an, a, 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 a free uh, kind of seasonal special exhibit space for the ICA um, that was uh, embedded in a, a, the community uh, on the other side of the harbor. Um, it, it, there's actually a water taxi that connects you there, but there's a very strong visual connection across here as well. But, you know, this is where, uh, unlike the, um, the context of the previous project I just showed you, the installation, physical architectural context becomes important here. That, that's our site right there. You're seeing the short end of a 300 foot long uh, former copper pipe manufacturing plant. Um, what's to the right of it is a steel fabricator, and it's, it's just an industrial area right on the edge of the water, and then behind it is all neighborhood, residential neighborhood. Um, but for us, this was really about not only the context of the building, but also the context of these boats, which are actually being worked on here. They're not just being stored. And then there's the sort of the reality of the project. We very quickly discovered when we were under construction that the structure that was there was sitting on piles that were completely deteriorated, um, which is always a happy surprise for any <laughs> for any construction process. So we had to very quickly redesign the project to just create a spanning beam across the overall space. So essentially, this building is um, just a roof in a sense between two existing buildings uh, inside of it there's a you know there's there's a kind of uh, uh, object 
uh, inside from the entry side of it that is, you know, the ticket booth and bathrooms. And on top of it, we have a little lift where all of the crates are stored for the whatever piece happens to be in there. It's, it's always just one artist every season. Uh, and then we've put a couple of other pieces here and incorporated some of the old tectonics of the building as a convening space that overlooks the waterfront. Um, both ends of it are essentially industrial in that they're upward acting doors like hangar doors modified a bit instead of hinging at their outer point there's a kind of overhang to it and then there's this narrow very long skylight nearly 300 feet long that just washes light along a wall that we allowed the sort of palimpsest of everything that existed before it to stay there and we did the same to the floor we just essentially ground the floor and patched it um, and it's th it's that simple a project. Again, this sort of reiterates the uh, relationship of, of of the building to the uh, the two buildings on either side of it is just a roof. Uh, the neighborhood starts back here. This this is sort of the industrial area, and there are some very prominent uh, parks, the Pier Piers Park, uh, and the waterfront, and then overlooking again back towards the the uh, ICA building. Uh, and this is the sort of uh, the context of it again when we, before we, uh, you know, uh, did the addition or the renovation to this project, there, there's the, what the facade was like as an extension of this building and the kind of industrial materials and language we used to have it uh, distinguish itself from the context and at the same time be an integral part of it. Internally, the Skylights, this was the, the first installation by uh, Diane Thader, where she immediately gelled the skylight as part of her exhibit as well, which was quite interesting for us. Um, and you can see on, on the right side, the, the wall of the of the older factory building. Uh, and then John Acumfra was a, a second installation the next season where he used the skylight in a very different way and then built this large volume in here. And this is the kind of joy of this building is anything can happen in it. Uh, and what happened in there was uh, a, a sort of a immersive video uh, exhibit. So uh, we're, we're working on the next one now. We usually work with the artists for these installations for the architectural components, but it's been uh, quite an interesting experience. Um, and then how these things in terms of both material uh, and, and form relate to the existing context. So you can see this is all new materials here, but even in these kinds of forms that are created by the open, large, uh, you know, inviting uh, entry is, is, is relating back to forms that exist there. The, the sort of palimpsest on the walls and on the slab, uh, you know, part of that were the old ra railroad tracks that would come right into the building to pick up the copper pipes and move them on. Um, and that all is part of the aesthetic. And again, the relationship in, in terms of forms, even with the boats, et cetera, and how we tried to connect with that context. But then internally, there's a kind of different world in certain places. This is the convening space that, that overlooks, uh, you know, and, and frames even things like, uh, you know, dumpsters and beyond, right? And th this is the reality of the context of this place. Um, and then incorporates pieces of the old building, this jib crane, which is just, you know, beautiful to look at and you can understand how it works uh, because it was uh, completely mechanical and then some of the old methods of making columns. And then that transforms depending on what's happening inside. So when there's a large gathering there, the space feels very different. They use different lighting, et cetera. Uh, and, and so this space is constantly uh, sort of uh, pushing and pulling in various directions. It's really a shell to absorb and accept uh, artists' work. Um, but again, the, the language of it externally even here when you're looking through the translucent wall is really meant to remind you where you are and connect with that context at a completely different scale this is a, a small observatory that we did um, for a, a a private researcher in new hampshire on the summit of a very high uh, point uh, in in an area that's car called a dark landscape which is that there there's no visible light pollution um, kind of desolate uh, on top, uh, you know, uh, wooded up to a certain point, and then they, they, they terminate uh, rather rapidly. Um, 
with with a residence about mm, half a mile below it. So it's a, it's about a half a mile uh, kind of uh, crawl up this very steep summit uh, to the summit. Um, and and this is the project in its context. And I kind of wanted to show this first um, because again, um, this is a tiny building. It's about twelve hundred square feet. Uh, but given its posture and position on the on the uh, top of the hill, we wanted to give it some some level of status and muscularity. And then, as usual, our interest in connecting it with context. And we'll look at uh, some of the technical reasons why uh, that inspired us to do that. But in terms of the building use, um, we we actually rather than looking at the kind of famous observatories uh, throughout time, we actually were focused on these little backyard observatories because they they um, they, they were more in tune with the scale of what we were doing, and we were very interested in this one on the right side in particular because there was no dome, and we wondered why does it have to be dome shaped um, as long as you can revolve. Uh, and open up a, a slot, etc. Right? One of the things on, on a summit, by the way, is that the wind is uh, treacherous. It's always howling up and around, so you've got to be able to protect the telescope. But this idea of this this roof moving, you know, uh, was quite intriguing to us, uh, and so we sort of started rethinking how this might work and went through a series of exercises. Uh, this started out as a tiny little building with a deck. And a you know a spiral stair going up to a dome. Um, the elevated deck was something that the uh, client wanted, which made sense that you could step out into the landscape. Uh, but it was kept compact for the sake of economy. Um, and then you know then the deck became something more because he wanted to put a telescope out there and what's called a warming room where you do all your studying and uh, charting and things like that. Um, uh, and a space that you can keep warm because, of course, the dome you can't because the heat itself will affect uh, the, the ability of the telescope to do its job. And then this, you know, the telescope on the deck meant, you know, in order to see over the dome, we had to move it further away and then, you know, move it sideways so that we could get beyond the dome. And then this Newtonian telescope, you've got to really stand on this side of it in order to do that. So that started to, you know, we're just pragmatically pushing and pulling things and then you have to be able to get up there. So we had we put a slot and, and slid that over so that, you know, somewhere along the stair you could actually get out there. And after doing that, we we went back to that notion of the of the sliding roofs and thought, well, this doesn't need to be uh, dome shaped, uh, 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 spherical. And quite frankly, the ones that we had gone and observed at this scale the telescope sits in the center and it means that the person who's there is often smacking their head at the on, on the dome itself so what we did was we tilted it so that where the, the a person was standing was actually taller um and the interesting thing immediately for us was that given that it wasn't a, a, a semi-spherical shape we actually had an elevation that changed especially when you put it in the cardinal positions it was constantly in flux uh, and we uh, put a window on there that once it's in a cardinal position, it, it has certain uh, astro astrological connections, especially uh, Polaris. Um, but, you know, one of the things that was problematic here is that the form we created, if you were just to apply, say, horizontal siding or vertical siding on it of whatever sort, um, the logic would be flawed because you'd constantly hit these sharp angles that where the building form itself was cutting it off. Um, so we needed to find a logic between surface and form, which this rubber band ball that our office manager keeps growing uh, uh, was quite useful in that uh, thought process. Um, and then also how to put apertures in a building that has this particular kind of shape as opposed to a simple composition of windows. Uh, and so we we sort of here you see the, the sort of just horizontal siding on it and the problem of these kinds of things. So it has the appearance of just being um, 
uh, sauce that you you know you know you've just covered the building in horizontal siding, and so we established these various lines of grade and 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 uh, and fo building form to create a kind of uh, you know, trajectory uh, for these pieces. And given and this happens to be a metal skin building, uh, given that it's metal, it's very possible to do this kind of thing, and then create a kind of you know the relationship between the texture and form uh, of the building that, that that one is feeding into the other and then the windows themselves are uh, the apertures i should call them are um they're 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 an intersection of two geometries one pushing into the other one pulling away and they happen to coincide with each other we'll see in the plan in the cardinal directions and, and intersect with verticals and horizontals uh, and this is the effect of the the whole thing. So um, interesting complication we created for ourselves in making these windows. These windows are not twisted, by the way, in any way. They're just very simple uh, windows. Uh, but the the their extensions, their the returns on on the on the um, jams and head and sill are what are uh, related to the skin. How to make this now? Look at this, this, this sort of like nightmare. Imagine if you had to draw all these pieces because every one is different, and dimension them right for the fabricator to make. I wouldn't want that job. Um, so, this is where uh, the the reason we refer to ourselves uh, as in kind of um, not not. Um, uh, as interdisciplinary rather than multidisciplinary is we don't stay in our boundaries very well as architects. Um, we tend not just to collaborate with our partners, be they fabricators or sub consultants, engineers, but we tend to, you know, uh, uh, affect what they're doing and their work tends to affect us. This is a, a great example of that where what you're looking at here is the building unrolled. The, the whole bit of siding that we need to make this building and just looking at that and trying to scratch our heads and figure out how how could we convey this to somebody well we we found a a, a, a fabricator here who uses a cnc break to cut the material and a cnc break to fold it They're, these are folded over each other what's called lock seam construction um, and what we did was provide them with this digital file and they created all of it without a single dimension because the the, the information was inherent in the um, drawings that we gave them, the digital files that we gave them. And what they did, because reality is never exact uh, like a drawing is, is they just left out the corners and they built it all. And the only thing they measured to, to build to were the corners. So it was a rather quick process as well in, in that they showed up with all the pieces already made. And this is the ultimate effect of, of how these um, bands that sort of wrap the building are related to both ground plane and <clears throat> building geometry. And um, the in, in section, the interesting thing about the addition of this deck was that we had to have a mid landing on the stair, which created a pretty interesting opening here. I think I have a photograph of it. The other part of this for us that was you know, just a real education was there's a complete disconnection both in the in the pier inside the dome and the pier on the deck have to be disassociated with the structure completely because any minor vibration, as you can imagine, looking millions of miles away would affect it. And then we capitalized on this geometry in ways of bringing light into the building. So there's this large opening here that's about 15 feet tall into this very small building. Uh, and then we we borrow light from the outside and flood the actual door into this warming space uh, with it. And th this is uh, what you're looking at here is the, the ground level and the, the the helical stair that takes you to the top with these two disassociated um, piers uh, and the warming room space and a place to sleep and a place to work and then a deck above and then this piece that we'll look at in a minute. This was kind of an invention of how to make this thing actually rotate because the the little precedents that we're looking at the two little backyard things they just use casters sideways below and on the outside as a way of stopping the dome from moving it's a bit rickety and it works and it rotates this is was a heavy piece 
uh, all, by the way, built with uh, SIPS panels, structural insulated panels. So the building came in pieces uh, and was assembled very quickly. Um, but uh, in, in order to make this work and not shake around and maintain a, a certain thermal break, uh, we had to do some kind of interesting invention here, which we'll, I think we have. So here you go. Uh, there's the uh, this is the the intermediate stair that takes you out to the deck and this kind of interesting relationship to the sky, uh, and then the of course the helical stair that takes you uh, up to the uh, the dome space itself. Yeah, so this is this is the kind of uh, we we created a gear inside. So this large ring is is a is a big gear that was uh, laser cut out of uh, steel, and then on top of that we incorporated what looks in section like a railroad track and has trucks on it that are connected to it very tightly. Sorry. I thought someone asked a question uh, that's connected to it very tightly uh, and has essentially no friction to it. And then we created another piece that's laser cut that that that's calibrated for use by the uh, astronomers. And th the way that works, uh, the way that you get that kind of rotation is like that. So there's a cantilevered steel structure. Uh, on top of that is a drum, and that drum then has the the component on it and that that's sort of here, here's what the sensation of that is like it, it's quite interesting because as you turn the crank you're turning the dome on top but it really feels uh, like the uh, like the entire building is rotating you can see as you look out the landscape he's not moving of course that's Mazin from my office cranking that but what's happening is the top of it is is rotating and this is actually time lapse by the uh, by the owner of the building. Um, these are real images. Uh, it's interesting. This is in New Hampshire, just a couple hours north of Boston, and you can see Aurora Borealis from the summit here. Um, that's how dark the sky is. And then, just purely with the architecture, we chose zinc because of some of its qualities of of patinaing, but also because of how it's very changeable in color. You see here at a low sun angle, it, the building picks up the shadows of the trees, the windows pick up the reflection of the trees, and this is it begins to engage the context. Um, this building is on a solid rock, you know, summit. You know, this is how you connect it. It's not a typical what you expect as foundations that either drill down, etc. And we weren't willing to blast this. We wanted to have a kind of light touch there. So we cleared off all the loose stones. We built the building and then we had the great pleasure of going out with the contractor and putting all the stones back to create this kind of um, this expression of the building and it's it's kind of angular forms, having a relationship to the stone that's there, et cetera. So all of that, the color of the material, it's, it's you know, textural qualities, material qualities, and it's, its ability to change it, it, you know, with the light uh, that's uh, ambient at the moment <clears throat> are all reasons why we chose that material. We studied many different materials, and this is the one we ended up with because it could do all the things we wanted to. and. Uh, almost have an, a, a kind of affinity in terms of its color with the surrounding um, ledge. Um, this is our community rowing boathouse. Um, that is uh, where that green star is. It's it's a it's a part of a whole series of boathouses on the Charles River, as you probably know, is a, a heavily rowed river um, where. Um, uh, you know, an annual regatta, of course, is is the is a big event here, um, uh, and uh, this is what the context of boathouses looks like. The bottom two on the left side are uh, very authentic buildings. It's the men's and women's Harvard uh, boathouses. They they are what they appear to be built of their time. Uh, other ones that you're looking at are contemporary interpretations of that. Um, there's a sense that that's what boathouses should look like, but we had a problem because we were our our client. First of all, was the only nonprofit um, organization. Uh, I shouldn't say that. The, I would I should say the, 
the only non-elitist organization that was going to build a boathouse. This was meant to be community rowing is sort of like the YMCA for rowing. Everything else that you see here belongs to an elitist institution or it's a very private elitist club. And so they were, their mission was to, I think it, it, they call it rowing for all, meaning that make it accessible to people. And interestingly, 42% uh, of all the boats on the Charles River were going to be housed in this building. And we didn't have much footprint area to house all those buildings. To give you an example, the, the 170 boats um, that are in the building uh, occupy the same footprint as the um, as the um, Harvard boathouses that, you know, probably have 30 to 40 boats in them. So we turned to different antecedents regionally. Uh, we looked at uh, covered bridges and things like that. This happens to be a tobacco barn. We, uh, I'll show you some uh, studies we, we made. I, I don't remember how many floor plans to try to squeeze all those boats in there, you know, and limit the surface area of the of the building itself because it, it's a nonprofit uh, that needed to, uh, you know, stay within their budget. But we looked at these tobacco barns because one of the problems, typically boathouses, the boats come out perpendicular to the building. We realized that we could compress that and and be much more efficient in our storage by running all the boats uh, along the length of the building, but they needed to dry because they come in wet. That's what made us think about the tobacco barns. Uh, and then, of course, as we observed and took pictures of rowing uh, and, you know, having driven through many covered bridges, we started to see some kind of almost tectonic relationship between these kinds of buildings rather than looking at the antecedents of uh, existing boathouses on the Charles. Um, and so, you know, this was the site that they were able to secure. It's on public land, but it's a it's a private organization. There's a kind of partnership there. Um, so it, very narrow for what we were charged with doing. And, you know, we, we noodled around for a while with various ideas and went through. This is just one little subset of, you know, angled parking and parallel and perpendicular, et cetera, and weighing the difference between how many boats we could uh, house and, and the amount of surface area we need uh, uh, around that form. Uh, we ended up doing something kind of interesting was we, we ended up um, parking the boats along the length of the building, but we separated it into do build, two buildings to uh, do two things. One, reduce the second floor program, which sits on top of this portion of the building, and two, to cook to uh, consolidate the small boats in one building that was completely un unconditioned, as is the lower space of this building, and uh, limit the second floor space. What you see here are the longest bo uh, rowing boat docks in the world. Um, it, 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 it's just the, the throughput here. When we came to the project, the throughput of boats here in the morning session was 350 boats, rowers, sorry, rowers would come in, row and leave by nine o'clock. It's now 650 that do that. And these are now connected to each other. So it's 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 become a kind of interesting place. But we were intent on maintaining or actually not maintaining, reconnecting this path that is a really well known jogging path where prior to this project, it was a derelict site, a staging area for a highway uh, work with big, gigantic six foot diameter valves, and it was a brownfield site with oil soaked into it, et cetera. But, you know, people had to kind of come across, run across these large kind of openings into this parking lot, which is the only boat uh, launch into the Charles River, and then come back onto the, onto the sort of parkland. So we were intent on maintaining this, uh, yet we have boats crossing this constantly. So there was an exercise here that I think was quite interesting of like, how could we make, and th these are, boats are 60 feet long. They're, they're, uh, they're longer than a tractor trailer, right? Which the, the trailer part of it's 40. So they're 20 feet longer than a tractor trailer, the big boats. And so these kinds of diagrams we had to do over and over again to get this to actually work. That's why you have these uh, interesting angles to the ramps that go down to the docks. But this is what we started with. A, a kind of a, a, amazingly that it was a staging area for highway work right on the river. Um, Brownfield, uh, there was a lot of reclamation we had to do here, uh, but this is what we ended up with.
where the parking lot itself, which used to drain directly into the Charles River, now drains into swales. Uh, and then all of that comes to what you see beyond here, which is the uh, a, a, a retention basin with digestive plants in it to, to clean all that up. Uh, and, and this is its kind of relationship to the river. Um, we initially had this idea that it would be a glass building because we were enamored of the boats. They're just so beautiful and, and um, efficient um, that we, we thought we'd just show the boats, but that proved to be too ex expensive. So this, this move of, of creating a kind of separate building for the small boats allowed us to create a kind of frontispiece as a, as a sort of billboard with the, sec the, the, the larger boats beyond and the second floor activity space. Uh, workout areas, locker rooms, et cetera, beyond. Um, and, and this is uh, sort of a very simple building uh, where we invented, I'll talk about these skins briefly, uh, but we invented a kind of a cladding system that's, um, they're, they're actually glass shingles. Um, the building uh, picks up a lot of UV, but the hotter it gets, the quicker it cools itself off because the air moves through the entire building. Um, and then there's the, the balance of the building that has sort of, in, again, industrial doors and has a kind of interesting skin on it that, that is actually kinetic. Uh, this was an idea that we picked up from the tobacco barns to allow air to actually, and it does, in, induces a flow and moves through the building to dry the interior out. Um, so just looking at these three skins, um, there's the, the glass shingles uh, that, that this is sort of a, design development drawing. And then we've got the kind of, let's call these operable panels, uh, but it's that kinetic skin. Again, you know, we, we th this is again, one of those things in design where we, we maintain this sort of relationship here so that this would appear to be a clear story window in a one story building on the river because it's a small river. It's not the Hudson, it's the, the Charles, which is a tiny river. Um, but but just to give you some idea, these are these are eight feet tall. These are 15 foot tall operable panels. But when you look at it, it doesn't have the sense that it is a kind of multi-story building. And then these louvers, which create this kind of signature pattern for the building, are there to do several things. One of them is to create texture, uh, tessellation of elements, but also then to create larger patterns that again are constantly in flux depending on the time of day, time of year, and your position in space with respect to the building. But they also do some interesting things in allowing us to have ventilating fans with your traditional, you know, louvers, not because we don't have a front or back here. You have the river on one side, an underserved neighborhood on the other side. We weren't willing to put mechanical components facing any of those. So they reside behind this and allow, and as do the locker rooms, for example, they face the parking lot, but they're made private by virtue of these louvers. And the, the, the leftmost drawing is the, is the uh, glass building that allows air to move through the gaps between them and up between the shingles themselves. The, the kinetic wall allows air to move through it uh, to be pulled in along these sort of gills that it creates. <clears throat> and then the uh, louvers allow ventilators to be there uh, and all the sort of technical stuff to be hidden by something much more architectural, but it's also the south facing wall. So as that heats up, it draws air up and past the building where we have an outlet on top. And the way these are assembled are really simple actually. We had to create components to clip this glass on, uh, and these these are the actual mock-up pieces that are. These are inexpensive compared to the Pilkington, uh, you know, the point-loaded glass because we created a profile and extruded this out of aluminum and cut these up uh, to make this work. And so, even making this custom component for this building, there were enough of them where it was economical to do. Uh, and it has a taller piece in here than it does down there where the glass sits on the bottom. And we actually slide here a, a neoprene block in it as a way of securing the glass so that if one of them breaks, you can change any single shingle, which is again, a, a, an operational thing that you need to think about as you're designing architecture. This is how these, um, these operable kinetic pieces work. There's actually uh, polycarbonate behind them to allow uh, 
water that's shedding from the upper floor to make it past these and out the bottom of the building. Uh, we, and, and these were made again with two components, one stable and the other operable, but they're identical with one piece cut off. So we you had to figure out a way of making just one extrusion that you could make a lot of and then cut one part off to allow it to be both the, the static element and the, the piece that moved. And in this case, this was relatively simple. We created an armature um, that ran down the building vertically. They're sort of U-shapes and these clips get connected to it. So you have adjustability vertically. Again, for real world application, nothing is perfect. This adjusts vertically. And when you screw the panel onto this tube, it's adjustable sideways. So that way you can get everything to be perfect, even though what's behind it is not. This is what I wanted to get to, though. All of that kind of complexity visually happens with one simple thing. We take a four by eight sheet, we cut one foot off of it and use it for the ceiling in the lobby spaces and, and other spaces. And then we just put a simple diagonal cut in it, creating two symmetrical trapezoids. So the material, by the way, is a composite phenolic resin with actual wood on either side, and it's double sided. You can use either side. So that we capitalizing on that, we flip them both horizontally and vertically, and we got that many combinations out of it on the right side, panel combinations. And when we put those panel combinations together in the upper left corner and offset them by something that wasn't an exact dimension, so these are not offset by, by 50%, et cetera, they, they keep shifting and then repeat themselves. The, the, these are put together like that, and then you can see that's the repetition. What happens is there's a larger than uh, pattern that forms of these uh, kind of parallelograms. And this is the ultimate effect of it. We have a bend in the building at the, at the floor plan near the entrance. And so you get this happens sometimes, and sometimes it looks dead flat depending on the light. That's the texture you get looking at the material directly. And we'll look at some other um, uh, forms that it takes. But it's a very simple building, actually. It's built like a warehouse, completely. Just a steel frame with insulated metal panels on the outside, the armature, and then the skin. Um, and you can see here already, this was a discovery, again, digitally, that by doing what we were doing, the kinds of other patterns that formed that were unexpected was this diagonal scalloping, um, which was not uh, intentional, but something that happened during the design process. So I just wanted to show you this, but this is always interesting to me to see how uh, mute the building actually is. What you see up here are the locker room windows uh, that are that are concealed by the louvers and uh, a large meeting room where the, the, those louvers thin out and the lobby space here and then the boathouse underneath and the workout spaces and admin spaces on the other side. But that's, you know, that's what the the kind of deliberations on detail material form light etc led to in this project um, and then on the interior de decisions like in because it's a boathouse that is available to any kind of rower not just elite rowers um, boats when you're moving them out of a building and you're turning can so easily hit the center column and you can bust the tip of it off so we created the building with moment frame so there was no center column um, in making those moment frames, from an engineering, structural engineering perspective, there was no need for these columns to be the same size. They were di of different sizes when they were developed, having to do with where they were relative to the overall length of the building and the torsion that was created by lateral forces. What we did was something very simple. We architecturalized those frames. We, we exposed them, but we made them all the same size. We went to the largest one and made them all the same size. So the interior is extremely simple. It's just repetitive columns, a concrete floor, et cetera. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise uh, venue. So that worked very well. What was interesting for us was how light came into it. You can see here that it's just flooded with light. The windows that appear to be clear story windows can be opened, 50% of it can be opened because they're actually sliding windows. So um, it was meant for low energy consumption. It has a um, geothermal well that is now completely operated 
uh, from a power perspective by the PVs that are on the roof. So it, it uses no energy to heat and cool the building at this point. And these are the, the combination of those two materials, this sort of in the flat, and a, a photographer took this image, which I really like because at, at this end of it, you can start to see the diagonal scalloping here, then it, it kind of looks like maybe, uh, you know, dragon scales, and then a lot of people refer to this at times as they, everyone thinks we did this to make a symbol of waves that were related to the water, which I find interesting. It was completely unintentional, but we enjoy the multiple readings of it. And then, of course, the flatness of this in certain lights and when they're closed. This is the kinetic wall. Uh, and I think this is a video. Oops, let me go back. Mm, that's too bad. Sorry about that. Let me just see if I can do that again. There you go. I just wanted to show this to you because it's kind of interesting. This is all um, uh, a very simple mechanism. It's a turn of the century Victorian uh, chain pull with a gear reducers that were used, you know, essentially like for uh, say a uh, greenhouse is to open the top and let the heat out. They're indestructible. The chain, if it breaks, you just, you know, repair the chain, but the gearbox is sealed and it's just opened and closed manually. The entire 280 foot length of the building is opened and closed manually this way. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. I, I wanted to also just look at a different scale building. This is a speculative office building in um, about 250,000 square feet in Ankara, Turkey. Um, but the same principles as that little installation that I show you apply to the way we think about this project. It's in Ankara, which is uh, in sort of central Anatolia. Our site, and it, it's, it's very hilly, um, Google Earth, did no justice to it looking at it in plan. I was shocked when I first went there. It is treacherously hilly. Um, this, there are two centers of town here and the city is growing in this direction and this is our site right there. It's very interesting that this side of this very important highway that's called es Eskashir Highway that takes you to the city of Eskashir, on one side of it is, is, a, is a classic uh, uh, strip the other side of it is bucolic because it's a it's a whole series of universities one after the other that are sitting in like typical university settings so it was kind of an interesting thing but we're we are on the on the on the opposite side of the universities and just to give some you know i'll 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 point out why this is important but we were very lucky to get a site right at this at this nexus of transportation the you know, they have the small buses, the large buses, taxis. This is actually a metro line that was in and opened just after we built the building. There's a, 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 a kind of growing neighborhood to the north. There are a few high rises here that we'll look at, and then they've continued uh, since we, we built this building. This piece of land here will always, I think, remain. Uh, it was uh, it's, it was at part of Ataturk's farm, so we do have this kind of advantage of looking out in that direction at nature. But this side is very different. Um, this is all kind of a bucolic setting of universities. Interestingly, some of the distinguished buildings these happen to be party buildings. Um, they uh, clamor in a way for um, identity. You know. A, a, in kind of uh, interesting ways. There's there are those sorts of buildings, and then there's the the new housing that's replacing uh, what what appears to look like sort of uh, Tuscan houses down here are not that at all. These are nearly shanty town houses. What's holding up these tile roofs are two by threes. Many of them are collapsed and deteriorated. And this whole hillside, for example, all of that that you see, this enclave back here, were all this. That's how the city came to be in 1923. Essentially, the, the, it's a kind of interesting way of populating the city, but uh, it, was, it was, I don't know, 53,000 people and is now a city of 5.5, 5.6 million. Um, if you squatted on the land, and the, the actual thing was if you built the house overnight, you owned the land. So these were built in great haste and 
to their detriment ultimately. And what the government is doing now is uh, displacing the people by giving them temporary housing, tearing those down, and then building these extremely repetitive apartment buildings and then moving the people back into them. Um, there's a whole social issue there that's not part of this discussion, but it's very interesting what's happening there. Um, and then more immediate context, our site is just to the left of the leftmost building. Are these buildings that you, they're so different from one another and yet they look the same and you realize, oh, it's because they, they suck up the entire zoning envelope. It's sim simply put, that, that's what they're doing and they have different dresses on. Um, they, 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 don't, um, they, they don't contribute to the public uh, uh, cityscape. The space in between them is the only way to get from this sidewalk to the other side, and it's one car wide, and cars come careening down them. Um, so we were wondering, for example, if you were in a wheelchair, how you would get off a bus and you could get to the neighborhood on the other side. Things like that became very important to us. On top of that, our site was the smallest one in this entire area. Um, and so if we looked at, at purely a zoning envelope, what we could do was what's indicated in this white box. And that I'll show you is even taller than the, than the number of floors would indicate um, in, in this way. Um, we had all kinds of zoning constraints, but the height was not limited by zoning. It was limited by the Air Force because of a, an adjacent Air Force base. And so we were able to, in this office building, make floor to ceiling 12 foot floors. Um, when we thought about that, and then the center core, that red, uh, uh, a piece, we thought, well, that donut shape is in a sense useless. And if we look in this direction, we're looking at a bucolic landscape and it happens to be south. So we decided to do something different, which is in a way a developer no-no. We moved the core to the edge of the building. But what we, we realized in, in, in working through those ideas that what we had in a sense was not like office floors but a stack of lofts because they were you know very spacious um and then we had the issue of our building being small and it's a speculative building it wants to stand out somehow and so we thought about how repetition you know maniacal repeti repetition might achieve a kind of abstraction in terms of its scale. But in order to do that, unlike our surrounding buildings, what we needed to do was create a mechanical floor that had a well for the chillers. So you didn't have the usual, you know, uh, shielding of it that never fools the eye. It's always something on top. So in, in our case, you, you can't see it because it's all pulled in as a well. And then we set it in a bamboo thicket. Um, it just essentially to indicate to the neighbors, perhaps there's a different way of doing this, that rather than taking up the zoning envelope, you can go a little bit taller and reintroduce nature into this side of the street. And that's a, that's an early, that's a model that, that was built with the project. Really simple plan. Um, the rectangular tower uh, is actually rather than having an entrance from the highway side, this is the subway by the way, and this is a, a side road and the highway below and the bus stop. Um, and then uh, the first road to the neighborhood to the north. First thing for us was to create a ramp here that was at grade, handicap accessible from one end to the other. That was critical. Uh, and our owner, thankfully, was also in favor of that. We then rise to the center of this this floor level so that rather than having the entrance on one side or the other, you actually have to penetrate the site, move through the bamboo thicket entrance. It, if that becomes a desirable way, the, the argument was that this, which is a cafe, would become a pretty valuable space because all of those office buildings who have, that have entries on this building, none of them have entries on the, on the highway side, would pass by this cafe as they went to work and came back from there. There's a, a large collaborative space on, at the lobby uh, that's meant for, you know, anyone to hang out in, but really is meant for the, uh, for the offices if they want to have larger meetings or, or events to take place there. And then the elevator core um, and, and uh, egress paths that are then pushed to one side of the building. Um, the cafe is sitting on top of a mechanical space 
uh, that has a kind of frame around it, uh, 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 I should say a veil. Uh, it's a glass building that again is th sitting on uh, uh, in a bamboo thicket that's planted on top of this one story building. Um, and then there's a kind of sculpture court out here that's meant for uh, to engage the local public uh, to have that annually uh, replaced by local artists. And then it, very simple, the floors are uh, very repetitive. I'm not going to show you. There are four or five stories of, of uh, parking below. Uh, all the planting is on built ground because it's, a, again, a tiny site. But uh, there's your core, and then you just get a 12-foot tall large space. But it's very technically um, uh, kind of uh, tuned. Uh, the floor is elevated. It's a, it's a pressurized floor that allows very easy movement of registers. Uh, and diffusers and things like that, um, lots of views, but because our building had to have longer east-west sides to it, we have a, a serious glare problem from the east and west. Um, this is the roof of the, of the building below, the cafe and the beams that hold this veil up. And then we had a lot of really talented architects working on this building, and we came up with a sort of tartan grid. Um, Part of this was to make, to distinguish the building in several ways. One was to give it a, a kind of scale that was hard to understand so that it had the potential of seeming bigger than it was to give it some stature. The other was to create something distinct by being quiet, because as, you, as, as I showed you in, in a lot of the examples, they're exuberant in, it, to put it mildly, they're exuberant buildings. So this was meant to, uh, uh, you know, keep this sort of quiet on some level uh, as, as a building. Um, and the, what we achieved with that was this sort of thing. These were some early renderings that we were looking at where, um, you know, looking at the building in the oblique, it seems to be much taller than it is. And this was achieved by, by having the spandrel, the, the floor be, how it's expressed is exactly the same as as the as three more stacks of that that uh, constitute the space itself, and you can see it, it's not a very tall building, but it it has the appearance of being taller. And again, with the facade, we were really interested in how what was what was kind of interesting to us here was that we had a, a road, a highway, um, you know, paths that people walk on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there there's the potential here of experiencing the building at many different distances and at many different speeds and so the idea of putting a vanilla curtain wall on there was not appealing to us at all and one of the things that always happens on a curtain wall typically is what's called a cover cap either vertically or horizontally one one can be silicone but the other has a mechanical fastener and the cap conceals that so rather than do an extruded one, which would have to be the same all the way across, we had this idea of getting some kind of uh, action going between um, the, the floors so that we could get some kind of dynamic um, uh, uh, expressions of the building as you moved past it. We thought about this, which was to create identical pieces and flip them, but out of folded aluminum rather than extruded aluminum. Um, and these, these are the components that we came up with. That's it. The whole building is made of these pieces. And we worked again. This was partnering with, um, a, on, a, on a kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary level, pushing a, a fabricator and manufacturer their curtain walls to work with us in rethinking uh, how this might be done. And it, they turned out to be a really great partner. It was, it was kind of uh, uh, educational and interesting for all of us. But this is sort of what we ended up doing, where we tested here digitally, you know, in order to go from a, a, um, a front edge, which is changing in thickness, to a back edge, which has to be exactly the same depth, uh, you get these facets. And so you can see already here that some there's, first of all, there's an abstraction of scale because the, the spandrel is exactly the same as the repetition of other, uh, 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 the, the occupiable space of the building, but then also there's a potential for light to bounce off these in different ways. Here's what we ended up doing. This is the 
these are these are uh, these pieces are quite deep too. They're over a foot deep, and they're you, this little piece you see drawn down here is because it goes from being almost a point to something that's as wide as the back side of it. Um, embedded in that are these. This is the spandrel panel here, and you can see these are identical dimensions. We, they're just they're about 1.2 meters each, and that's how you get this very tall space here. Um, and then this set here are actually operable, and this is how we dealt with. Rather than have a building where curtains and blinds are drawn, the building dictates that you can't put those there, and these are automated and respond to the location of the sun. From a sustainability perspective. A glass building, you know, without insulation is kind of an interesting issue. What we did with these was, again, create a completely self-shading building. So not only does it do things for us in the abstract, in repetition, in, in stature, et cetera, but it also shades itself when it needs to in the summer. And then a, along with the louvers can do many things. The upper, the upper um, register of louvers it operates differentially from the lower one, so we can bounce light onto the ceiling deep into the building and then sort of displace it and diffuse it uh, when necessary uh, with the lower ones. And these are made, um, again, you know, it, it's something that we had to sort of invent. The shape has to do with the fact that we don't actually close them but overlap them so you can still have a view out the building and so they would glow with the light bouncing in. Uh, so they're aluminum extrusions, which we were not interested in having as a material inside, but they're covered in wood um, to, to create warmth within the space. And so this little animation you see on the right side shows what would happen with this building over time, you know, from as, as the sun moves from east to west, uh, you start with these open and then they eventually close down and the building is automated this way with overrides at every single bay right on the curtain wall mullion so that if you want to open it or you want to close it because you're giving a presentation or whatever you can that creates a building that's quite dynamic that even though the building resets itself at night during the day it's just constantly changing uh, and so you know while the wood behind the glass creates this kind of gold-ish image that's similar to the the buff stone in the area and that 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 was part of its calibration um it it does things like it can be this but it can also be that and it can be many different things because all of these bays operate independently depending on who's using it and then the stairs expose themselves on the left side because of the way uh, they uh, open but in these sort of diagonal steps and the effects are kind of interesting. There's there's this where at one distance just looks like horizontal banding, but when you get close to it, you realize there's a kind of play occurring here. Um, and then at night, a very different scenario. We control the perimeter lights because they're part of the emergency lighting system. So rather than, and I think you'll see in one of these photos, do the wild facade lighting that you see on a lot of these buildings, we let this building be quiet and just glow from the inside out. What you see on the bottom here, um, these lights are about fist size glass spheres with a single LED in them. There's 700 of them in the lobby. Um, that has to do with a, a change in scale from day to night. This space up here is quite large. It's a little over 25 feet. And the space underneath the lights is about nine feet. So it creates this scale that was something that we actually uh, enjoyed when we visited some of the mosques because the evening prayer they would have to be able to reach up back in the day to light oil lanterns uh, or candles or whatever they were on top so it was this sort of double space with all these wires running through them and this sort of picked up on that other parts of the calibration of the facade had to do in terms of the location of the louvers with respect to the glass had to do with this so what happens here is when the sky reflects off it, this is what it looks like, but any building that reflects on it, rather than reflecting the building, when the louver is closed, it turns into this wood cutout instead. Um, and then, you know, similarly, it, it, at night, there, there's a, the kind of glow. These are now all open. And this is this veil of uh, fiber reinforced cement that is covering the, the, the bamboo is, is just been planted so you can't even see it. it. It is now sticking up past the building, but this is the band in here from there to there where the cafe is and then there's technical space below it. 
some of the effects of this facade, which are, you know, in this case, just appear to be horizontals. In this case, there's a little bit of dancing in them. But when you walk past the building, this is what happens to that. The, um, you know, that that sort of banding as it turns the corner, um, it, you can't see the glass anymore. And then they appear to be two different facades. And it, this is so, so extreme case of it, um, which and so this is something that your eye catches even peripherally. Similarly, when you look up at the building, all kinds of patterns form and they change. It's like eyes in a painting following you a little bit. Uh, they change as you move around. And then that portal through the building connects back on the right side to the, the city. And on the inside, uh, you can sort of see it like just beyond here. That's some of that uh, uh, GFRC veil that is uh, this kind of signature for the cafe that's inside. And then the lighting inside and, and the, the, the bazillion wires that drop from it. And the effect of sort of like being inside of a musical instrument, let's say with the light glowing soft and the texture of it. And then when the light isn't so harsh, uh, we, our, our lobby is elevated to a point where when you look across, you essentially look over the highway as though it was a ha ha and you're looking at the kind of bucolic setting of the uh, universities beyond. And the relationship of those two objects, again, that I think everything I'm talking about is all also meant to be applied to every scale. So these two sort of re prismatic, you know, rectangles that sit next to each other have a relationship like that on the left side of, of two volumes that are similar and dissimilar. And then on the right side, it's the concrete to the cementitious veil that create, you know, as you can imagine, all kinds of patterns of of, uh, of shadow on, on the concrete beyond it. And th th this is the facade lighting that I'm talking about. You see beyond it, it it's like it's it's very exuberant again. So we tried to distinguish this building by doing something different like this. Uh, the top three floors are now occupied by the uh, um, Belgian embassy. So. It's been quite successful, uh, even though from a developer perspective, the notion of moving that core at the get go was quite an interesting exercise. And lastly, I just wanted to show this um, project, which has not been built um, for various reasons, um, which I won't go into, uh, mostly uh, political. But in any case, it, this was an exercise of, um, let's see, this will go. There you go. Uh, this was an interest that we had in starting to look at um, rigor from the perspective of not the plan or the section, but to think about it parametrically. Can we make great sections and plans by approaching the project parametrically? So what you're looking at here is this, this shape, a form, that uses two planes that intersect with each other and all of its variations as possibilities. So from that uh, uh, kind of series, we, this taxonomy was created of these two. Just think of it as sticks, uh, you know, from this V shape to that V shape to an X and everything in between as those points move past each other. And then again, computationally, we determined which ones are actually occupiable. Uh, and so we eliminated the others and we ended up with this set. Now, what, what part of our oops. Um, part of what we did here was we, we started with the same frame on one side and the other, and then these run down. You can see that the next one and the next one, and the next one are the same. So you have the X here and the X up there, but this is at the front end and that one's at the back end. That would, that would allow us like a DNA strand to put them together to make various kinds of forms. And they're not dependent on this rectilinear base either because we can distort that as well. And, and I'll show you what we did with that. And, and the, but we were interested here in, in using just really simple materials. So rather than take the, the frames and have to cut very um, specific shapes here to take on the curvature that is created by this, we use rectilinear pieces from that stack and let their overlap create variation in translucency. So that it had a direct effect on interior space and form.
And this started out as a grid, and then we, we started to um, manipulate it a little bit to create variation in sizes. And then we started to develop, again, parametrically, a pattern of voids, or let's call them courtyards, and linear spaces. And then we apply several times different kinds of organizations of the uh, of the of the the sort of uh, taxonomy of parts that we came up with. And I think what was interesting in some of these is that the outside leg, like for example, here, the outside leg of this one and the inside leg of the next one coincide rather than the way these two connect to each other that create a single internal space by intersecting those here it happens here as well if you walk inside this one you end up outside in a courtyard and then back in so there's this kind of not confusion but slight ambiguity between inside and outside and all these micro courtyards this was meant actually for the project in Ankara to be the first um, sculptural element there. We did something else that I'm not going to show you, uh, only because I don't have images of it yet, but this was the, the first exercise. Uh, and again, all of this is done parametrically with, again, our decision making had to do with visual feedback, and we would alter, again, the, the script rather than redraw something by hand um, to respond to our um, our interpretation of what we were seeing. And I think, you know, when I look at this, I think that it's my conclusion was it's possible to be very rigorous without ever drawing a plan. And these are sections and elevations um, that to, to me also indicate a kind of rigor that is possible. It's the same kind of thinking. It's just a different approach and different tools. And I'll just end with this slide, which is a, a model that we built. Uh, of, of this particular piece. So with that, Bob, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I hope I didn't go too long. here. Alex, this was great. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, um, you know, uh, one of the reasons I wanted you to talk uh, about your work is that, you know, I mean, you could show 10 projects a few minutes each, but you, you I, I knew you'd pick a handful and really dig deep in them. And I think that's really useful for student audience, a largely student audience, and even professional audience for that matter, um, because we get to see um, how you, you know, get to a real detail level and very often how you do with great economy. And I think that's one of the things that will mean more to our students a few years from now. Yeah. When they find themselves in, in a professional Bob, inter interestingly, these days, too, we're so inundated with imagery of architecture just nonstop. Right. If you think about the zine and our daily, et cetera, we're, we're consuming images so quickly that I think we have it's it's easy to become less critical of what you look at because there's no depth often to what you're looking at. It's, there, it's kind of eye candy. And often I've stepped back thinking that, wow, that that's a interesting project and you, you look harder and go actually it's not and vice versa so yeah thank you for saying that i i do prefer to get deep into something because i hopefully it, it helps in some kind of dialogue about architecture as opposed to architecture as a as a set of flashcard images right 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 um well well let me um i mean i could obviously sit here and talk to you all day but let me open up the chat window um you all are our audience do you have some questions you'd like to ask alex about his practice about projects and uh so on um okay michael stevenson asks uh can i have a job no he doesn't say that he said <laughs> you will be inundated with 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 portfolios and and cvs that's and i hope you're braced for that that's good fine what uh softwares do you use um for initial design and the kinetic components? Uh, that's an interesting question. So we use uh, lots of things for different reasons. Uh, we tend to draft, do 2D drawings with a program called Vectorworks, uh, only because we've used it for years and we like it um, better. It's more um, more commonplace in Europe than it is in the US. Of course, our, our, uh, AutoCAD is more common here. Uh, even though it's a 3D modeler as well, we never use it for that. We use Rhino strictly for the 3D modeling, especially in design. And then we use ARCHICAD for production. 
management and production of a project. So they're used in very different ways. Uh, there's a fluidity to Rhino that we really enjoy. There's a great management of projects, systems, you know, uh, interacting with our partners and our engineers to be able to put things together as much as possible um, uh, it, digitally before they're actually built. So we catch all the things that would be expensive in construction. Uh, and then, of course, we use lots of other things we use, you know, for for animated things. We often use Bongo uh, in conjunction with Rhino, etc. So we sort of use it all depending on what uh, what we're trying to do. Mm. I remember when you set up the first office with Nick, you had um, <laughs> very powerful, <laughs> you know, it was like you were you were all you had was the, 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 the Starship Enterprise front deck there, you know? Yeah. You, yeah. you had very powerful Macs, I think. In we the did. Yeah, we did. I mean, for the time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Not the my time. watch is actually more powerful than those computers <laughs> were, but uh, right, right. yeah, we did. We, we started at a very, we embraced kind of the digital aspects very early. I, I happened to, again, too long a story, but I happened to, in a previous life, end up being forced into programming computers in the mid 80s for something that I was doing and for which there was no software. And that got me into, you know, the idea that the tool was really powerful. So when we started, yeah, we, we embraced it. We were a two person office with a, a giant plotter, a uh, digital plotter when everyone was pretty much still using pen plotters. Um, yeah. So, uh, for us, the, the, they're tools, right? Yeah. Uh, we never stopped hand dra drafting. When even when we had those tools, and even though we don't hand draft anymore, we sketch like crazy, yeah, uh, as, yeah. as ways of conveying ideas quickly in, in shorthand to one another and to ourselves. Um, someone, Amina, asked, "What uh, project management software do you use for all the design phases?" Project management software. Can you see this hand? <laughs> these are the these are the five brothers, and they run. The, <laughs> We, we, we are a pretty small studio, um, you know, we've always been under 20 people. And so we don't really use uh, project management software. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Can we get a little more clarity on the question? Amina, do you want to talk a little bit more about what you mean? Yeah. You can unmute and ask us. I mean, it's left a lecture. She didn't like your answer, apparently. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, if okay. it's... To track all tasks, such as Trello. Oh, no, we don't really do that. I mean, our project managers manage the projects um, without software. I mean, we, we do use schedulers sometimes, but, you know, in the end, um, we don't really use software for it. We still do it sort of uh old school <laughs> yeah how yeah. many is in the office now i don't know it's just me <laughs> I, I don't know what happened to everyone else they're not here anymore <laughs> uh i don't know we've just hired like three or four people so i i um we're probably four, 14 something like that 14 okay good something uh yeah uh, we're having our, our uh, the, it, this is a terrible time for me because our controller of 21 years is leaving us. Oh, and you know, without a good controller, you doesn't matter what you're doing. Your business can't run. Yeah. So we're making that transition right now. And so I have a headache behind my eyeballs because of it, but yeah, yeah. So I can't even count the number of people. I would usually ask her, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's evolving a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, d d it seems like there's some architects that have been with you for quite a while now, right? <laughs> yeah, we're a, we're uh, maybe to our own detriment. I don't know. We're very slow to hire people. Most of our people have come through uh, by, you know, summer internship. And then sometimes, you know, if your school has an in-between semesters internship, we've done those externships. They've come twice. And then by the time they graduate, we know them. And, and we have people like that. We have, we actually have two senior project managers, one who's been with us 12 years and one nine years who started that way. 
Yeah. Um, it's a great way of getting to know somebody. And if it, it's not going to work, it doesn't work. We invest a lot in people. Um, and so we, you know, they're uh, not, uh, there's a number of ways of running an office. One is to staff up when you got the projects and just let people go if you can't carry them. We tend not, we have never done that. What And we invest a lot in people and people work hard for us when we need that work done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's served us well, but it doesn't work for every firm. It's it's different for every firm. That's just yeah. something that's worked for us. I was thinking today, you know, about your talk and I remember you, you telling me you guys very often eat lunch together in the office. We always eat lunch together. This is where we blow off steam collectively. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah it's a kind of this is one of the things about the ethos of our office that's really dissatisfying at the moment is that everyone looked forward to lunch, and I worked in offices where everyone escaped the office at lunch, yeah. uh, you know, which is kind of a norm sometimes. But yeah, no, here it was like get your lunch, get to the table, and and you know start going at it arguments yeah. and you know we we would leave uh, even political correctness behind it's just where people got to know each other really well um and it allowed a venue for a kind of um, a, a culture to grow out of food i mean it, to the extent by the way which i think is very important where we had a a, a maple syrup smackdown <laughs> because it was an argument between two people, one from New Hampshire, one from Vermont. I was going to say, we, these are New Englanders. <laughs> we had the blind taste test smackdown that included commercial brands and handmade ones. Things like that happen all the time. Um, we had a vegetarian in our office who decided he was going to try fish. He, had, he was in his 30s and hadn't eaten meat since he was 11. And he went out and caught the fish and we went out into the parking lot with a little hibachi and we grilled it and we all ate it together with him the first time. So, yeah, we have a, a big culture of eating together. <laughs> I won't ask. what happened. I could tell too many stories like that. <laughs> <clears throat> we had a black pudding face off uh, to test the various black puddings in my parents' hometown in Scotland. A few years ago. So it was and, and black pudding is blood pudding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. And um it was interesting. <laughs> um, Phil asks, which one of your favorite projects, uh, which one is your favorite project out of the series you've worked with? And uh, I'll add, you can also answer that same question for you about your kids. <laughs> <laughs> you go, this is my second son and my third favorite. Right? <laughs> uh, well, to be honest with you, uh, Oh, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't have a favorite project. Every project that we do, when it's built, I typically wince because what I see are the potentials that we missed. And that's not to say that I'm um, uh, pessimistic or I see the glass is half full. I just see that the glass was not designed correctly. <laughs> so, um, you know, design, the, the only reason we stop designing in practice, because from a disciplinary perspective, we never stop. We, as you, hopefully, even though there's no stylistic relationship between these projects I showed you, there's, there's I hope that you read a kind of common way of thinking about them. But in the end, um, we stop because we have to build. We stop because there's a schedule. We stop because there's a budget. We stop because there's a program. Someone needs to build their building and move into it. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I tend to be the type that when I look at it, I'm like, ooh, it could have been perfect if only we had. And those are the things that you, no matter how much you digitally and physically model things and draw through them, built reality is just different. And, you, you know, perception is different. And so I, I always, what I enjoy uh, about making buildings, the big kick I get is occupying with them and interacting with them and quite frankly, seeing their flaws because those flaws feed into our next project, right? They, they teach us something about the next one. I think if I, I would be like Aaron Copeland, you know, if I said, I got it, right? Because when he got it, he stopped writing music. Um, I, th I think we're in pursuit of something that I hope we never quite get there. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a research exercise, a lifetime research exercise, I think. So I can't answer that question. I honestly don't have a favorite project. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think um, universities, schools talk a lot about research. Um, 
the students understand research in one way. And, and we do like to, you, you know, we still have a thesis project, as, as you know, a lot of schools don't. And um, the thesis becomes this moment where they kind of not only pull everything together, but pick it apart. And, um, you know, the active research is something we do want to instill in our students, because as you point out so clearly, you know, this is a just, be just the beginning of, the, of architecture as a research project, you know, say their thesis. Um, and good firms, great firms like yours, continue to research things and literally invent things be inventive, but also invent things if they have to. And, and I think, you know, taking a sheet of plywood and understanding that it can, with two cuts, become a dozen different things is kind of genius, you know, uh, and, and following through on that. And, and those are the things that you, the firm does that I think are just really fascinating. Yeah, we get excited about those kinds of things. When you, I think when you work, at, you, you toil away at something and then you discover something really simple, uh, that's a that's a real reward for all of the work. It's it's not you know it doesn't happen because we're so talented or so smart or whatever. We just work really hard, and if you work hard enough, you discover things that are you know amazing. Uh, and then and then of course you always discover afterwards that somebody else has already done it. <laughs> that's that's the <laughs> other part of it because there's so many people who like you know thinking and and working. So but yeah. th there's a pleasure in that. You see that oh there's a like mindedness about somebody else or some other firm or some other designer that came up with something with a different twist on it and you learn from them and vice versa. It's just you know what a great uh, what a great uh, you know, thing to be involved with as a lifetime uh, yeah. profession. Uh, you know, someone asked, what are you, when do you plan on retiring? And I was like, retiring? Retiring is, I think, for when you don't enjoy what you do, you retire to go do what you enjoy, right? Um, and I, it was like, I already do what I, this is the most fun I ever have is when I'm yeah. at work, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny it's, you say sure. that. I was thinking, you know, you're the same age as I am. Um, and, you know, how long are you going to do this? And I was thinking, he's going to do this, you know, till they carry him out. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I, want, I want to stroke a line and then and have a stroke. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah, no, I think it's just it's the greatest. I, I'm so glad so many young students are involved in it, et cetera. We, we love we love hiring the young students, too, because they see things in a different way from us. And we, you know, we rely on that kind of dialogue. Um, yes. It's just wonderful. It's multi generational. It's multicultural. It's all all across those grains. Um, and right now, what what I really wish I could have talked about, but I just don't have the materials uh, that are presentable, is that we're we're showing. I think Bob, I told you we're we're uh, exhibiting at the Biennale this year. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, and what what we're focused on there is actually a project that we're working on right now, where we had a client who couldn't afford our fees. And couldn't afford a, a you know a a, a a house of the quality, not size, that he was looking for, and we found a way of doing it. We're we're about to start building it right now. Um, you as told a, about this a while yeah, back. Talked yeah. about this, right? So, and we're, it's actually happening. It's a it's going to be passive house, you know, German engineered windows, triple glazed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for literally you know a price that is unbelievable, and that led us to think about additional dwelling units, uh, sorry, accessory dwelling units, and what it means to make these some some awful small buildings. It's it's hard enough to be in a small space. And, and as much as there have been so many interesting technological stabs at it, the bed that comes out of the you know, ceiling and the kitchen that slides over to become the living room and you know, all of that stuff. Right. They're not they're not elemental. They're to me, it, it reminds me of the 1970s house with the intercom system in it. It right. was really amazing. And then five years later, it was like a dead dog. Yeah. Right? You just ripped it out of the walls and got rid of it. So the technology doesn't interest me at all. What does interest me is how are we going to make these houses? How are we going to make them of high quality, both from a sustainability perspective, but, but also from an architectural perspective, when every single one of them can't be designed by an architect? because it's just not economically feasible. I think there's a chunk of young architects who could each design one as a way of like learning how to make a building. But in the end, I think we have to think about it in a different way. We're thinking about it from a modular perspective where components can be rearranged, 
my set of components. You design a set of components. Somebody else does, and they need to be something that can be rearranged to suit different lifestyles, different demographics, different understanding of what family means anymore. You know, it, that's such an expanded context now um, that if you have uh, economic diversity and, and you do so by having small units, how do they capitalize on their smallness without the need for gadgets to make it all work? Right. And that's what we're really interested in at the moment, even though we're doing a project <laughs> on the MIT campus and, you know, plenty of large houses and things like that. Our focus is on other disciplinary things that are are we're confronted with because it's a it's a real problem. I well, mean, you know, we, we had we had a okay. we had an employee leave our office. She and her husband were both architects working at good firms and they oh. left because they couldn't afford to live here. Yeah. It couldn't be anything sadder than that. So, um, yeah, we're focused on other things at the moment. Uh, but all of this feeds into it, right? All of this, uh, we, we treat all the same way. And I think it's interesting that you're taking up housing as a kind of practice agenda and a social agenda. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? It's, because that's yeah. global. That's not just Boston. That's exactly. Global. Exactly. I that's an issue I mean, in Tampa. I think, yeah. I think it's interesting that Hashem it chose the theme that he chose uh, so appropriate for the Biennale, which is how will we live together? And he looks at it from, you know, the scale of beings to the scale of the planet. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, as architects, if we're not focused on that, we're missing something. We're right. missing a point at the moment because it's, it's at crisis levels. Yeah. Right. It is. I mean, we, we are doing a little bit of housing work here that we're proud of, but it's, it's one person at a time in a way, but it's, it's important. But that's and, how you do it, though. You have to. You have to. Yeah. You know, you, you, there are two things that have to happen. One is, as as a discipline, we have to be focused on solutions to real problems, like really working through them. And the other is, as an organization, I would hope that our representatives would be working at a policy level, and it has to happen from both ends, right. because it won't happen uh, simply by through good design. It has to couple itself with uh, policy level decisions. For example, ADUs are a great example. Cities and towns, the, the debates that are going on about the, 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 the promise of or the evils of ADUs is very interesting. But it's at some point. It, explain what ADUs are to everyone. So on a single family site, which you all know what that is, like your house sitting on the site, the accessory buildings are like a garage or a shed have other limitations that are not the same as the house. So you can put the garage closer, for example, to the side yard setback or the front yard set, potentially the front yard setback, than you could the house itself. And the scale of it has to be much smaller. So if you take the, the, the boundaries, uh, the zoning limitations of an accessory building, and you say an accessory dwelling unit, you're now in a sense creating a two family site out of what is zoned a single family site. That gets into all kinds of complexities because one could say that you're violating zoning and, and that's why it has to happen from a policy municipal level at the very right. least. Right. But more importantly, there is the, the demographic discussion. If you're depleting your demographic because only wealthy people can live here or only older people who've lived here for a long time can afford to stay here, then you're dumbing down your demographic. So there's all kinds of social arguments to be made about why the accessory dwelling unit is beneficial for, for the older person living there. A young couple could be helpful for the young couple. The older couple could be or older person could be helpful because they could be a built in babysitter. There are so many scenarios that are possible in that uh, in that sort of uh, 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 scenario of having this smaller unit occupying what would otherwise be a garage or whatever. So and those are they're being approved in certain cities and towns, but many of them are being built just, you know, like the, it looks like it's either a mini me, which is, you know, the town insists that it has to have the same, you know, materials and character of the existing building, which it isn't, in my opinion, a very smart thing to do because the small building, the 400 to 600 square foot house needs something different than a, a, a 2000 or 4000 square foot house needs. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of apertures and space and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and flexibility, which is another issue. But in any case, that's what an accessory dwelling unit is. It's a way of densification um, of 
suburban and urban areas uh, by virtue of uh, of of <laughs> by virtue of uh, lifting in a sense the zoning restriction which doesn't allow it and they you know they used to be called nanny pads right or or granny pads that yeah. where your grandmother or your mother would move in but she couldn't have a kitchen she could have a sink and a hot plate and whatever but you couldn't have a like in in massachusetts you can't have a cooktop in there because that's a second kitchen and that could mean two families could live there and the interesting thing to me about that is it is a a, a municipal or government level dictation of what constitutes family and today that's a hard one to argue yeah right yeah, that's because that's become very fluid and uh, and we've become more open and accepting that that's so if that's the case then those are antiquated uh um regulations as are plumbing codes for example the plumbing code dictates that you have x number of men's bathrooms and x number of units for a bathroom for women right and so universities today want to build gender neutral bathrooms end of story they just want to build bathrooms what a great idea it, it along with that comes a, a kind of luxury to it especially if you build them as single bathrooms rather than ganged bathrooms well the we still have to comply with the state code which is so antiquated so often we just finished a project at harvard where you, you have to name them certain things for to get your permit and and, and occupancy permit but th then they're used differently so it's the kind of reality of of culture changing before regulations have caught up with it well and I, think and, the, I think the adu is in that category yeah well. and the adu is interesting because it has a place in older fixed cities like boston and its suburbs yeah. which have been around for a long time and I also hear people in LA or here in uh, Tampa right. and Ellis County talking about it as That's a way right. to densify the suburbs that are built out, but they're flat. You know, yep. there's a lot of space. It's all filled, but it's one and two story. Yeah, and there's the interesting uh, case of Minneapolis that kind of just lifted its zoning regulations and said, you know, whatever. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Let's see what happens, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if we get, you know, uh, mixes that we question but yeah there's a there's a lot of discussion about that now and i think it's it's coming because there, there's a young population and you know if you're not in a in a field where you're generating a lot of income what are you supposed to do yeah move somewhere else yeah. i mean i have situations like that now with you know architects people with a profession and a degree etc who if they want to buy a house in the boston area they literally have to move out to 128 and beyond which yeah. means now they need a car. Oh, they're married, their wife works, their husband works. They need two cars. Yeah. It's suddenly it's untenable. Uh, yeah. And they are removed from the urban environment as architects. So it's just, you know, it's, it's a, uh, to me, a very serious problem. And we're excited about some of the things that we're developing right now because we are completely partnered with a panel, panel manufacturer. Um, and so, and, and an engineering firm that we, we've all partnered together to try to create a product, um, and which is part of the subject of what we're showing at the Biennale this year. Um, it's very, it's in its early stages, but we're excited because we think we can, we might be able to make some really great small buildings, um, that are both sustainable, uh, and, uh, just, you know, architectural rather than, uh, an expedient of whatever plastic and fiberglass. Yeah. Well, it's exciting, Al. Um, we've been here, it's f about five o'clock and I think we're gonna lose our audience, but I just okay. wanna say thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. I have a student here looking for an internship and I'll tell her to go to your website. <laughs> okay, yes, there's a place <laughs> on the website to do that and our office manager handles that very well. So please, if you're interested, let us know. Yeah. And uh, thanks a lot. It's good to talk to you. Sure. I'll catch good up to see with you. Good to talk to you too. I can't see you at the moment, but uh, I, I have my screen up. So, okay. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, okay. Man. All right. Take care of yourself. Be, Be well. well. Yep. You too. Bye bye. Thank you all for tuning in. And um, the next lecture again is April 1 with Brian Cantley. And I hope we see you there. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye bye.